Did you guys want to test your slide sharing or anything, or are you guys good? Oh, we can test it. All right, feel free. Looks good. Good. Perfect. All right, it's five minutes till, so I'm going to put us live on Facebook. Um, so just a heads up that we're going to do that. Uh, Victoria, you're online. Let me know when you're on, Victoria. Ah, there you are. Okay. Hi, I'm, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to go live on Facebook, so I just wanted some eyes on the chat box there, just in case, um, since I probably won't be able to watch everything. Yep. All right, let's hope our internet and everything supports all of this. We'll see how it goes. Here we go. So Victoria, are you still there? I am. Super, super slow. It's not even getting me to the log on page. So I'm logged into Facebook as well as Zoom. So I'm, I have it both, uh, both pulled up. Okay. Um, if it doesn't go live on my end, could it go live on your end? I have, it could. I have no idea. Have we got it? I think my MiFi, like my internet is not. And you're recording it as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep, so I'm going to go in and I'm going to make you a co-host. Okay. Once I do that, if you can you go to more and stream to Facebook live or do I need to make you a host um, I just have record to this computer if you I don't know yeah try making me a host and seeing what that will do
uh, okay. okay. So then you, yeah, I have, I have now can now do Facebook. Okay, and that that took all my privileges away. Just a heads up. So, yeah, but do you, you mind to streaming do, to Facebook? Yeah. Do you want me to give you co-host then? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Victoria, we met you some, I don't know, a year and a half ago or so. Good to, to, good to see you on here. Yeah. Good to see you guys, too. I think we saw each other at the conference, too, didn't we? Yes. The Rural Health Conference a couple of times. We did. I took my video off. Sorry, I didn't want any, I don't have my makeup on or anything. I didn't want anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. worries. So let me know when we're live, okay? Yep. I'm going to make us live on Facebook right now. Awesome. Okay, I'm Thank ready you. to get started. It's preparing to stream. Thank you. Okay. All set. Thank you. Great. Okay. So we have a good group on tonight. Um, we've got 67 participants, which is a great number. So we are streaming live on Facebook right now. Um, we're doing this uh, just as a pilot, just to see, you know, if we have um, an audience and whether we bring value. You cannot get a continuing education credit through Facebook. As many of you know, um, there's no back end way of knowing who's in and who's out. Um, that would, well, that would just change Facebook altogether, right? So, um, so just a heads up, if you're on Facebook Live, join us and send us some feedback, make some comments in the comment box. Um, you still get the free education, but you cannot get a continuing education credit. That is um, the only downside. So. So enjoy the presentation. Um, we have Maternal 911. Uh, Shelly and Michelle are on tonight. They are very experienced in the realm of OB emergencies and gynecology, and they're going to take us through and um, run us through some emergencies with uh, OB. I'm going to let them kind of explain what they're going to go through. I'll let them take the floor. But before we get started, just a couple other announcements. Um, we do have some great workshops coming up um, that I can tell you more about. Uh, it's with Paige Wolf and Wolfberg, Worth and Wolfberg, sorry. Um, so those workshops are gonna be surrounded um, or focused on EMS sustainability. And um, also we're doing a CADS course, a documentation specialist course. So those two are coming up here in October. We have dates posted to our website. If those sound interesting to you, check us out and shoot me an email. Um, and we are gonna have an EMS Leadership Academy that's going to be coming in 2021. Uh, that is a very popular academy for EMS leaders to come in and learn some, um, some great leadership traits. So lots of great things happening um, at the office. Next month, we're going to have Aaron Reinhart on with us for our EMS webinar in September. He's going to be talking about the Myers-Briggs personality type indicator. Um, he's going to be our special guest. So check that offering out for September. Now, uh, if you haven't already signed into the chat box, um, go ahead and find the chat box and sign your name. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Ventrunal 911. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much and welcome everyone for being here tonight. I'm Dr. Michelle Becker, co-founder of Maternal 911. I've practiced in Carson City for the last 20 some years. I'm sure I've met at least some of you picking up women from our labor and delivery unit there and transferring them. So appreciate everything that you all do. And hopefully this will help add to your repertoire of information and education for your next pickup. And I am Shelley Betancourt. Um, I am an RN, now I'm a women's health nurse practitioner. I have 25 years experience in patient obstetrics. And now I'm working in the outpatient setting, taking care of women um, there. So changed change my focus a little bit, but found the value in obstetrics and realized the OB deserts we have across our state as well as the nation and how that impacts you and the job that you do every day. So we are hopeful that this helps you 
gain knowledge so that you build uh, confidence and comfort as well as develop those skills that are needed to protect our women and our children. And so tonight we'll go through this didactic portion, which we estimate will take about 20, 25 minutes. Then uh, back here, we have a model, a simulation model, and we'll go through an imminent birth simulation. Then we'll take a little break and then we'll do the same for shoulder to social. We'll go through a didactic portion and then go through a simulation on shoulder to social as well. So let's get started with imminent birth. Imminent birth is something that will uh, continue to occur in every facility, every, every town across um, our state, across the world. This course will explain how to prepare and what to expect. Participants will gain confidence so that when they're faced with these situations, they are more prepared. And you can see, we'll be sure to go through some of your EMS patient assessments. So if you have any um, comments, please comment in the comment box for us as well. But as you know, the first thing is to make sure you're, you're seen as safe, going through their chief complaint, that history taking with the sample, the signs and symptoms, their allergies, their meds, their past medical history, their last oral intake, and any events that have occurred. Then their, your primary assessment, your secondary assessment, the vital signs, we'll go through APGAR scoring, and then that postpartum assessment if they've already delivered. So we'll, we'll really work hard to touch on some of these points through the course as well. By the end of the module, we hope that each of you will be able to perform a brief assessment and recognize an imminent birth is going to occur. Implement appropriate steps to complete delivery of a precipitous birth, including maternal positioning. Recognize a nuchal cord, reduce or clamp and cut that nuchal cord, and apply suprapubic pressure when indicated. Complete and assign an APGAR score at one minute and five minutes. State how placenta separation occurs and in what time frame this should, can be expected, and de demonstrate uterine massage when uterine acne is present. And so we know an imminent birth or precipitous labor lasts no more than three hours from the time it on, the onset of it of contractions to delivery. Each year, hundreds of deliveries in the United States occur precipitously in emergency departments and medical and surgical hospital rooms as well as outside the hospital setting in homes and in cars where you all will be called to. In fact, Shelly and I were sitting on the OB unit one day, sitting at the nurse's desk, and we had a precipitous labor delivery that we missed on the unit in the, in the labor room. She delivered by herself. One of those things, it happens there too. Fortunately, normal labor and delivery results in good outcomes in the absence of intervention in most cases. So we're very thankful about that. This topic will review those key points for assisting women during that imminent delivery of the fetus in the cephalic position, so we're that head down position. It's intended for healthcare providers who do not perform obstetrical deliveries as part of their usual practice and as a refresher for those who do, and then for new team members to any labor and delivery unit. That's what our course is mainly focused on, but today we're focusing on you all. Um, there's several videos available online that will show you how uh, to deliver a baby. Clinicians who may find themselves in this situation may want to periodically review them because thank goodness this doesn't happen that often for us. We have a, a website attached here for you to view this at your convenience, but we will show you in our simulation how to do that as well. And so for a, st a standard deliver, there's certain items that are needed, some antibacterial cleansing, to wash hands in the mother's perineum, some gauze spen sponges, sterile gloves and a gown if you have that available, a bulb syringe to remove fluid and mucus from the infant's nose and mouth, uh, two sterile clamps to clamp the umbilical cord, sterile scissors or a knife to cut the, between those two clamps, the appropriate blood tube or collection of fetal blood from the uh, placental end of the cut umbilical cord, um, clean blankets to dry and swaddle the infant, blankets and a gown to keep the mother warm, and then suitable containers for the placenta, the wet and bloody clothing, the sheets, and then a diaper. The first thing we do when an event like this happens is we call for help. Typically, we like to have um, an extra person, not just one person taking care of this woman. There's actually two patients. There's the mother and there's the infant, and they should each have someone to pay particular attention to them. The obstetrician and pediatrician or family practitioners can be called when we're in a controlled setting, 
but when you're out in the field, you're going to call the uh, people that you typically would to come and be those extra hands for you. And then you ask the woman for gravita and her parity. How many times have you been pregnant and how many children have you delivered? If she has any obstetrical um, or medical conditions, such as is she carrying twins? Is it preterm fetus? Um, has she previously been a cesarean? Because we're gonna to start to think about all those health conditions, that are, uh, other emergencies that could happen if she answers yes to many of these. Does she know if she has fetal anomalies? Does she have a bleeding complication or um, conditions such as severe headache, visual uh, changes, epigastric pain, signs of that preeclampsia? We have to put all of that into our initial assessment gathering so that we can continue to get uh, and develop our plan of care. This brief assessment is the, is the fetus visible? Is it beginning to emerge from the vagina? That's known as crowning. Is it presenting part of the scalp? Is it the buttocks? Is it the feet? So are, do we have cephalic? Do we have a breech presentation? In 95% of pregnancies, the presenting part is the fetal head. Oh, thank goodness. Is there an amniotic sac intact or has it um, ruptured? If it is intact, leave it alone and let it rupture naturally. Otherwise, you're going to expedite that delivery by rupturing that. And, and these go through some of those history questions that are important to ask during uh, that intake or your first you know, primary assessment, because you want to know if she's having any of these issues. So then if there is time and equipment available, checking her temperature, checking her blood pressure with some of those vital signs, a fever could suggest chorioamnionitis or an infection around the baby, maternal hypertension where that blood pressure is higher than that 140 over 90 is the key finding for preeclampsia. And preeclampsia, it can progress to eclampsia, and that's where the mom has a seizure with this disorder. And that can be associated with life-threatening complications, such as hepatic rupture, pulmonary edema, stroke, renal failure. And further discussion occurs under our, our severe preeclampsia module with those issues. But I think recognizing those signs that if she were to start having visual changes or have a severe headache, you need to start thinking this mom might have a seizure and preparing for that. And when I think of the blood pressure, you imagine the woman in active labor getting ready to deliver, how she's, you know, so anxious anyway. So by nature, her blood pressure would go up a little bit. We would expect that. But it's really asking, do you have a history of through your pregnancy of having high blood pressure? If the fetus is not visible, Delivery is likely um, imminent if the, I'm, excuse me, if the fetus is not visible, delivery is still likely imminent if she's having painful contractions because the uterus will start to push that baby down and down, especially when those contractions are occurring about every two minutes, or she says, I'm feeling lots of pressure like I need to push, or you're starting to see the perineum bulge a little bit, even though you don't see crowning of the uh, presenting part. The second stage of labor where her cervix is completely dilated is about 0.6 hours in a nulliparous woman, a first time uh, woman, or 0.2 hours in a multiparous woman. The multiparous woman has already had a baby come down through that birth canal, so just makes way for that second, third, and so on babies to be delivered even faster. If contractions are several minutes apart, there may be time to transport the mother to a labor and delivery department or the nearest emergency department so that the delivery can occur under more controllable conditions with additional um, healthcare professionals. The fetal heart rate should be checked with a Doppler device by auscultation with a stethoscope or use of a portable ultrasound unit if you have one of those available. The normal fetal heart rate is between 110 and 160 beats per minute near term. Of course, if the woman is preterm and, you know, at 24, 26 weeks, that heartbeat can be out of those ranges. So just keep that in mind. Position the mother in a semi-sitting position with her hips flexed and abducted, bringing them apart. Knees flexed, also known as the lithotomy position. In the absence of a birthing bed or a table with stirrups, it is easier to deliver a, baby, deliver a baby if you put pillows or stacks of towels or if you have a bedpan in your rig, you turn that upside down so you can elevate the hips and get about this much space in between her buttocks and the, in the bed. 
that um, that will help facilitate delivery. Um, this provides that additional room so we have a place to do maneuvers. Um, alternately, the mother may lay on her side and you hold that anterior leg up, creating a width in the pelvis so the baby can come down through. And your support person, because she may have a family member there, you can put them to work at holding those legs for you as well. And we do that even in a controlled hospital setting. You get those people involved because they're right there where you're working anyway. And so inserting a large bore IV catheter into the arm vein is really important. We recommend at least a 14 or 16 gauge. We recommend you place that IV as soon as you can. Um, if she starts to hemorrhage, she's gonna shunt away from the periphery, making it more difficult for you to uh, achieve access. Instructions to the mother before the fetus is visible at the introitus. The mother will want to bear down and push according to her own reflexes, that involuntary, our bodies just take that over um, because she's feeling that pressure of that fetal head. Ask her to pant through the peak of the contractions and try to rest her breathing normally in between. This might buy you a little bit extra time so that you can get additional um, help, help, help there with you. Um, this will help keep her from bearing down and delivering uh, before you get that help there. If the fetal head is crowning, ask her to pant and make only modest efforts to push. So just little teeny grunts instead of outright pushes. Don't coax her into pushing. Um, this will help you to control that delivery and prevent the maternal and fetal trauma um, because that baby comes down way too fast. Well, and I have to say, sometimes you kind of really got to get in her face and like make her focus on you to concentrate about what you need her to do because it's such a crazy situation sometimes. And I, I know some women just can't, like their body kind of takes over and you can tell them to pant, you can tell them to stop and it's just not going to happen sometimes either, so. And I think you will recognize that right away if she's gonna be someone who you can get her attention or if you're not going to at all. True. And so we want you to control and help guide that delivery. So placing one hand on the infant's head that's coming out of the perineum and apply some gentle downward pressure to maintain that flex position can keep that head from popping out of the vagina. So when it pops out, then that shoulder comes through that vagina quite quickly and that can tear things down through there. And there's a whole nother issue. And so if you can ease that head and that face over the perineum by controlling that expulsion, it can work really well. We don't want anyone to pull on the fetal head, let the mother's pushing efforts expulse that baby. And then her strong urge to bear down will usually abate somewhat once that, once that head comes out, but you wanna ask her to push till that shoulder comes. And that's important so that we don't get a shoulder dystopia. After the infant's head is delivered, it will usually rotate to one side. So like Michelle said, don't pull on it, let nature take its course. It'll rotate that head. Then feel along the head and the um, infant's neck. You're feeling for an umbilical cord. If it's around the neck, that's called a nuchal cord, and you would gently want to slip that over the baby's head or push it over the fetal shoulder and then deliver it through, like it's going through a, a loop, a loop there. If the cord is tight and you cannot do either of those maneuvers, then you would doubly clamp, leaving a space between those two clamps. But recognize as soon as you clamp those two clamps, you've now lost maternal to fetal circulation. So birth has to occur quite rapidly after that or the baby will become hypoxic. It is important to not rupture or pull on that cord because then serious fetal um, hemorrhage can occur. So once you put the two clamps on, then you can you know, move them Easy. both out of the way and deliver the baby. Um, with the next push, guide the baby's head slightly downward so that anterior shoulder slips under that symphysis pubis and delivers and then guide the head slightly upward. And these motions are kind of happening all pretty quickly with this situation. If the shoulders don't deliver easily though, have your assistants or the mother sharply flex those thighs back. So she, if she is on the side, you wanna bring that leg way back almost to, so her knee is almost at her ear. And that helps open up the pelvis even a little bit more can make a big difference to get that maximum dimension. And she can be very helpful with that. So ask yeah. her to grab her knees and bring them back. That will help prevent any injuries to her hips as well. If you have her grab and hold them back. If you have a family member push on that foot, you could cause some injury to her hips. 
And so the assistant then, so if the baby still doesn't come out and that shoulder is still there, and we'll go through this in more detail with our next presentation specifically on shoulder dystocia, but the next step would be suprapubic pressure. So you'd have your assistants take their fist and put pressure down into the pelvis right above the symphysis pubis. We'll demonstrate that during the um, simulation part of it as well. If that shoulder still doesn't deliver, then that shoulder dystocia is definitely a, a diagnosis and an emergency. And we'll go through that in detail with other maneuvers with the next simulation and module. And most important is when uh, the fetus is not descending, do not push on the fundus, never apply fundal pressure. You could cause a uterine rupture. Once both of those shoulders have delivered, the rest of the baby immediately follows. So please be prepared for that. It just kind of slips right out at you. Document the time of expulsion or the time of delivery. Hold on to the baby with both hands or place it on the bed. So if you have the mom's hips up on that bed, pan pillows or stack of uh, blankets, just guiding that baby out onto the bed is probably the safest for you because you have a safe place to lie that baby down. If not, you can take the baby and place it on the mom's chest or her abdomen if the cord length will allow. Sometimes you deliver a baby and the cord is too short and you can't bring it up like that. So don't pull on it. Just know that you can't place it up as high as you had intended to do so. If the cord has already been clamped, then of course it's easy to place the baby up there. If the umbilical cord is intact before it is clamped, the infant should not be kept higher than the maternal abdomen because some of the blood tends to drain from the infant into the placenta and we can cause the baby to become anemic. So if you think about the mom laying flat like on a bed, you wouldn't want to keep the baby like held up above her for any length of time. If you just lay the baby on her abdomen, perfectly fine. But you know, if something's going on and you're holding the baby up, you want to try to get the baby down at the level of her abdomen just from the gravitational standpoint. So the newborn's neck should be held in a neutral way or slightly extended position to open the airway once it's born. The nose and mouth are wiped of fluids and blood um, and of the mucus with a clean cloth. Newborns are obligate nose breathers. So removing that substance from the nose is thought to help facilitate their air exchange. There's no strong evidence that suctioning with a ball or a catheter is beneficial. Have them around in controlled environments, but if you don't have them out there in the field, just wipe that all away. And, and even after a baby delivers, even sometimes after a few minutes, more of that junk comes out and just wipe more of that away. Hypothermia in the immediate newborn period increases baby's oxygen consumption and maternal or metabolic demands and is independently associated with mortality. Maintaining the baby's uh, body temperature is important. That's the first step you want to think about. Wipe that baby off, get that wet linen off, get some dry, dry linen on. Low birth weight in preterm babies are particularly prone to rapid loss because of their large body surface to relative mass. They have very thin skin and they have decreased subcutaneous fat. So again, drying, get the wet off, get a hat on if you have it, dry warm linen if you happen to have warm but any linen, but mom, placing that baby onto mom is gonna be the best warmer that you can have out there. Yeah, her 98 degree skin is a little warmer, so it works out really well. We know drying and suctioning the infant generally provides adequate stimulation to a baby, but if the baby is limp, not breathing, tactile stimulation should be initiated promptly. Appropriate ways to provide that stimulation just as the photo shows, lay the baby kind of on, so the belly is on your hand, and rub up and down the spine is a great way. Flicking the infant's feet is another way, but more vigorous stimulation really isn't helpful. So if those two things, flicking the sole or rubbing the back doesn't stimulate it, then you probably need to go into a full newborn code. The APGAR score assesses neonatal heart rate, respiratory efforts, muscle tone, reflex irritability, and color. Each of these five assessments are scored from a zero to two, with the maximum score being 10. Assign the, the APGAR score at one minute and five minutes after birth. About 90% of infants will have a score of between seven and 10. Usually they'll get a little bit off, maybe for activity or their color. Babies predominantly have what's known as acrocyanosis, where they're hands and their feet are a little bit blue, so that would be one off, so then you're down to a nine. Many of them have that, and that's a very, very normal. But your appearance is looking at that skin color, 
How blue are they? The entire body blue, just the hands and feet. If the trunk is nice and pink, you at least get a point there. The pulse rate, you have a normal heart rate for your baby. Grimace, I think about when we wipe the baby. Is the baby moving from you or if you have a bald syringe, are they making noises or gagging? Oops, oops sorry. <laughs> A muscle tone, are they moving their arms, moving their legs? Because if they're just laying, like we used to call it a dish rag, um, with no activity at all, you're not gonna get points there. And are they breathing? Do they have spontaneous respirations? Nice and easy rise and fall to the chest. No um, distress with flaring of the nostrils, pulling in between the ribs. Um, so normal rise and fall would give you a two for respirations as well. But the main point is, the APGAR starts as soon as, as soon as you have your delivery. So you want to sign a score at one minute and at five minutes. And that minute will go by very quickly. So keep an eye on that time. So if we look at the baby in the picture, you see how the baby's holding its knee flex and its arms are up here? That's a good tone to that baby. If you see a baby that's just totally laid out and its legs are straight and its arms are straight, that is not a good tone baby. You really need to be paying much more attention to that newborn. And so there's no urgency to clamping the umbilical cord. It is recommended to delay the cord clamping for one minute, as long as the baby is, you know, at the abdomen. If you have to hold it up and, you know, other situations are going on, then cut it more soon than the one minute. But one minute we found that it allows the baby to have some of the extra nutrients and uh, helps with their anemia as well. If it's not already cut after the baby's been suctioned and if sterile instruments are available, you can doubly clamp the cord between the clamps, cut it in between the two. There's no nerve endings in that umbilical cord and so you don't have to worry about it being painful to anyone. And then place the infant in the mother's abdomen or in her chest for that skin to sink in and you know, keeping it warm and as dry as you can. As Shelly mentioned, changing out the, the wet clothing because we've all sat around in wet bathing suits at some point, and you know how cold you can get, how quickly. So getting that wet stuff off and getting the dry stuff on will help facilitate their temperature. And if you have the ability to collect a red tube of blood, a red top from the placental cord, um, that can work really nice because it helps the uh, delivery in hospital where you take them to. They can determine the baby's blood type from that uh, umbilical cord blood. If there's sterile instruments for clamping, tying, or cutting them below, cord are not available. The cord can be a left attached to the placenta, but again, you want to keep the two even. Um, but we also know that a cooler room temperature helps so what's called the Wharton's jelly swell in the umbilical cord, and then it, it naturally clamps itself off with time as well. So it's kind of a cool thing, and if you um, have ever watched that in an in a umbilical cord, just with time, like if you take a picture you know, at one minute and at 10 minutes, that cord looks very different because that Wharton jelly expands as it cools and clamps that off. So it's just a cool phenomenon as well. And if you've never seen or cut an umbilical cord, it's kind of a, it, it's kind of a big cut there. It, uh, there's a lot of mass to that cord sometimes. Some of them don't have as much Wharton jelly as other by nature. So you might have a little skinny cord or you might have a big one with lots of Wharton's jelly. So yeah, it is interesting, the variant. Do not pull on the cord to deliver the, the placenta again. Uh, this may cause the cord to detach um, from the placenta and you could get a hemorrhage from that. There are three signs that indicate the placenta is naturally separating itself. The cord starts to get longer, there's a gush of blood from the vagina, or there's a change in shape. You really see a globulous uh, rise in the paternal abdomen. That means that that placenta is letting loose. Just let it happen naturally. We know that placental separation occurs naturally in 90% of deliveries within 15 minutes, 97% by 30 minutes. So there's no reason to try to hasten, hasten that process. It'll happen naturally on its own. Contractions typically diminish after delivery of the baby and then resume upon separation of that placenta. So she may verbalize that to you too, saying, oh, it's cramping really bad. Um, if the placenta is not expelled with those contractions, ask the mom to bear down. Because sometimes if she bears down a little bit, then the placenta will come right out. An abdominal hand should secure that uterine fundus to prevent that uterine from inverting. If you're going to pull on that cord at all or assess that, you should have one hand up on the, up on the fundus while you're assessing or you know, even thinking of pulling on the umbilical cord. Because if you pull on it, everything can come out with it, including the uterus, and then there's another emergency of 
the uterine inversion. If that were to happen to you, push your fist and put it right back up inside of there. It's going to be uncomfortable for her, but that's a lot better than having a uterine inversion. Yep. And the uterine fundus is the top part, the strongest part of the uterus. When time allows, start starting urotonic agents right after delivery of the fetal head is the most optimal to prevent that postpartum hemorrhage. This managing the second stage of labor has become a standard of care in numerous facilities prevent that hemorrhage. After the placenta um, is released, vigorous massage, holding the lower uterine segment, massaging the top of the uterus will most likely control that, that uterine muscle and it'll clamp right down. If the uterus continues to feel really flabby, you're gonna see lots more of vaginal bleeding. Administer uterotonic agents is recommended to stimulate that uterus to contract down and control the bleeding from those capillaries where that placenta was embedded. Typically, and if available, oxytocin is infused, 10 to 40 units and 500 mLs of normal saline at a rate that's sufficient to tighten the uterus back down. So you may have that wide open, for 100 or 200 mLs of solution, then you can clamp it or dial that roller down and slow down that infusion because her uterus is nice and firm. So it's all based on how much bleeding you're seeing and how firm the uterine fundus is. Save that placenta so you can uh, deliver that to the hospital facility with the mom and the baby. They may do some studies or need that um, for evaluation. And being astute EMS uh, providers, uh, during your history taking, you can ask if she's had a hemorrhage with the delivery before. And certainly if she answers yes to that question, that needs to be one of your number one priorities as soon as that baby comes out, is managing that second stage, helping with the delivery of that placenta, massaging that uterus, and being sure that all settles down right away. Because again, you could have a whole nother emergency on your hand if she starts the hemorrhage. And if that happens so fast and you've not yet established venous access, you can administer 10 units of oxytocin IM into one of her large muscles. So inspecting the perineum for lacerations, I think this is something that will likely be done at the facility where you take them. But if you see something and you see a pumper coming out from something down there, just applying some good pressure. And I'm talking pretty good pressure, right? Like putting your fist and putting some pretty good pressure on that area to help prevent that bleeding. If you do that for a few minutes, it will likely subside. Um, but definitely, you know, repairs of those lacerations are beyond the scope of the program, and that would want to, you know, be taking that patient in for that, either ER to pre repair that or the obstetrician. And our critical thinking, if you've administered oxytocin, you've massaged the uterine fundus, it's nice and firm, and she still has bleeding down there, quickly separate the labia, look at the vaginal opening, and more than likely, you're going to see a laceration. Remember, though, that sometimes the perineum will be intact and she could have a laceration of the cervix, which will bleed quite heavy too. Just continue your massaging, your oxytocin until you can get her to the facility. So now we'd like to simulate the uh, imminent birth. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and go to that. And then, um, And when you guys have a second, we have those polling questions too. So just let me know when you want me to launch those. Yeah. We could do it on break too, if you'd like, like during that five okay. minutes. Oh, I like that idea. Yeah. Because we'll take a break like from probably 640 or 645, depending on how this simulation goes through. Now, we all know in healthcare that most of the time when anything like this happens, it simply is not the healthcare professionals and the woman. We always have family there and they're always asking us what we're doing and making suggestions that what we'll, we'll do. So during our simulation, we kind of throw out some statements that we've heard in the hospital and that I know you've heard um, out, out in, uh, in, the, in the communities that you serve as well. So we're going to get started. So you've been called to the home of a 32-year-old Gravity 4 pair of three. And she states, I'm visiting from out of town, but I think I'm in labor. My labor has been fast. It is 12 o'clock exactly. So the family member may say to you, she's going to have her baby. You need to do something. You need to get her to, to the hospital. What's happening? What information 
do you need to obtain first from the woman? And then someone has to remember that this family member really wants some answers to those questions they've just asked. So what are we gonna do? And when are we gonna get her to a hospital? So there's some important questions to be asking. And um, one of the big things I would say is, you know, has your baby been moving? You definitely want to know that if their fetus has been moving. Uh, when are you due, right? Those are, those are really pertinent primary assessment, kind of chief complaint things. Um, so when you're due, has your baby been moving? How many deliveries have you had and how many have been vaginal? Um, because some women can say, yeah, I've, I've delivered vaginally, but if their last delivery was a cesarean, they've had four kids, then it's a different ball game that you're in. Um, any health problems before the pregnancy, during the pregnancy? Ask if they know their blood type, if they're GBS status. So GBS is a group beta strep, and that's an infection that can occur in the genital tract to a baby. As the, it's not an infection in a woman, but she carries the bacteria, and as the baby comes through the birth canal, it can obtain that infection. And so if she's GBS positive, it'd just be one of those things that you need to make sure you pass off to whoever cares for the baby in the hospital. If there's any problems, you wanna ask her if there's any problems with the baby during the pregnancy, or if she's had a membrane rupture, and if, what the color of that has been. She states her deliveries have been vaginal without any problems. Her last labor only lasted three hours, but she was transfused blood following the delivery. She's uncertain of her blood type, but she states her, she knows her GBS was negative. They told her to make sure she knew that. She's healthy otherwise, and she's felt her baby move all, to, all day today. There has been no um, concerns with the baby during the pregnancy, and um, she hasn't leaked any fluid at all, so her membranes um, have not ruptured. And there's definitely going to be family around, right? So the family member says, you need to get ready for all this and get things around so you, she doesn't bleed to death again. Well, you can't be, bleed to death twice, but you know how family members get dramatic and say things like that. Yeah. So that's a little cue that, oh my gosh, she had some major bleeding before. Now I need to be asking some other questions. So if some of you want to unmute yourself and be brave and ask some questions, we don't mind that at all during this process. So what, is some, what are some of the additional information that you would want to obtain if time allowed? Quick question, what did you mean by a um, membrane rupture? So, so the amniotic sac that surrounds the fetus, has that, has that bag of waters broken? Is it ruptured? Is she leaking fluid? And if she tells you that she's leaking fluid, your next question is going to be, how long ago did that rupture and what color was that? Because if her, her bag of water started leaking a day or two ago, that's a little more concerning. But if it ruptured just, prior to you getting there, um, that's a little bit better. And then the color, is it bloody? Is it greeny yellow? Has the, that means the fetus has passed a meconium stool, so there's been a, some stress there. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so okay. much. You're welcome. Her contractions are two minutes apart. So some additional information um, that, that we would want to ask, um, someone had chimed in and asked on the, um, on the group chat, the contraction. So contraction pattern, uh, have you been able to pick up baby's heart rate yet? Cervical dilatation, what part of the fetus do you feel? Um, if you can get a set of vitals, that would be your next step to get. And so a vaginal exam reveals the cervix at six centimeters, because you know, why not check? Something's going on down there. Um, the vertex presentation and then contractions are occurring every three minutes, lasting 60 seconds, so they're long, strong contractions. And the maternal vital signs are stable, because you've checked those now. And the fetal surveillance is reassuring with a heart rate at 145, because you could hear that. And the family members, again, asking you, it's not going to be very long. What are you going to do? Are you going to get help? And you all know, sometimes you need some person just to deal with the family members, right? We need that as well. So what is the immediate plan of, of management for this woman based on our current status? So you know her contractions are getting stronger. They're lasting pretty long. What are some things that you're going to want to do? 
Yeah, start an IV. Yes. I like that idea too, and prepare for the delivery. Yes, very good, very good. Um, if you have time to notify the facility that you will be transporting the mother and infant to, that would be great. Um, prepare for postpartum hemorrhage because she said she needed blood after that other delivery, and the family member said she's gonna she's gonna hemorrhage again. Um, and then IV access, so very good with that. We're trying to read some of your comments. Good with preparing the oxytocin, beautiful. I like the, I like yeah. the boiling water comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's 12.20 and she said, I felt a gush. And on exam, you see a large amount of clear fluid around that area. Because really, you know, scientifically, we talk about the amniotic membranes and the amniotic fluid, but bag of water, you know, saying that the bedside, you know, in that situation would be totally appropriate. Mm -hmm. So that role playing the family member, are you ready for her baby? When is the doctor going to be here, right? They just think a doctor probably comes too. Yes, yes. So what is your immediate management based on our current status? Yep, her water broke, yell for help, good. History of hemorrhaging, great, great. Great, great comments coming here, absolutely amazing. Yeah, getting her into the ambulance, because especially with her history of hemorrhaging, I love that idea yeah. because you know, you don't know what you're going to get after the delivery of that baby. Yeah, good positioning of that baby, get her in a birthing position, check her blood pressure, lactate ringers or normal saline, oxygen maybe, that would be good, yeah. And yeah. the question was there about whether you hang ringers or NS, it doesn't matter at yeah. that point. I mean, in a controlled situation, we almost always use LR compared to NS, but I say whatever you grab, just go ahead and start it, especially knowing that she, as a hemorrhage, you know, going on. And good, Renee, continue to rea reassure the patient and the family. That's really good. And a hand to the fundus, positioning, very good. So we want to check the showing. Pardon? I have a question for, for both of you that maybe would be great to, to outline for our rural providers with long transport times. Um, can you go over a little bit more about when you decide to stay and deliver versus when you should actually start transporting? What would be some some scenarios that would play out that would, you know, where you would want to get moving um, versus, you know, hey, we're going to stay here and deliver this baby? I think that's probably one of the things we we struggle with in the field. I, I think, well, definitely if, I mean, We've had actually in the hospital had people coming in that would say that they were going to deliver and the baby's coming and coming and they're one or two centimeters when 10 is complete dilation. So if you've been trained or you feel comfortable with the gloved hand putting your hand just inside the vaginal opening, if you can feel the presenting part is down low or you see it bulging on the perineum or you can see crowning, then, then you should stay there. But if, you're, if you've got a ways for her to come down from where the presenting part is and the vaginal opening, then I feel it's okay to tr start to transfer her. Now, if you're in transport and of course something changes, then that communication between the uh, professional providing care and the driver, then you might need to pull over and change your plan of action. But I think if you have space from the vaginal opening to the presenting part, then I think you can start your transport. Because I understand from an EMS professional that they said they used to be able to get a woman to a delivering facility in like 15 or 20 minutes, but with all these deserts out there, now it can be 45 to 60 minutes. So it's going to start to be a um, judgment on your part based on your initial assessment. Well, and I think too, there's some factors that you need to think about um, whether you stay in the home. I mean, if it's minus 10 degrees outside, yeah. right? It's then the home, yeah, is, is probably a, a better environment to initially bring that neonate into. Um, but with her hemorrhage history, I would say pack her up and get running, right, as fast as you can, because there is a fair amount who hemorrhage again, you know, the yeah. second time. And I see a comment about putting the mom backwards on the stretcher for transport, so I think that's a pretty good, yes. you know, comment there yes. too. Yeah. Yep. So. As long as your safety belts are in the right positions, yes. Okay. Good, good. Thanks for chiming <laughs> that in. Yeah, yeah. So I, the next part of this is what is your immediate action plan? And I think the number one is just to stay calm because we all know in a lot of numerous situations, if you start to escalate and get all nervous, the whole room, you know, goes that way. So as captain of the ship, if you keep the cool, calm, collected, 
you know, head, even if you're freaking out in your own mind and what you bring out, you know, keeping that cool and calm is really important. You know, calling for that first responder to help you or someone else to get in there and help you is a, a really good idea as well. Reassuring the patient and her family, as some of you mentioned too. And then planning to deliver on the bed I mean, for the safety of the infant is a good idea. Um, you know, some women want to squat and do some different things, especially if they're at home. Um, but then, you know, how do you catch a baby and how do you keep the baby safe in some of those positions? So and those, can, yeah, and those babies are so slippery. Yeah, yeah they sure yeah. are. And then have the assistant preparing the newborn for care and don't take your eyes off the perineum. So I think that's really important. You know, as this head is coming out of the, uh, of the perineum and keeping your eyes, you know, on that because it will, <laughs> of course, you know, we, we do this in real life. Like we do this with the mom's perineum. We sit there and kind of push on that tissue and, and push it back over the head, trying to help facilitate it so it doesn't tear. And sometimes, you know, after that head is delivered, yeah, it'll come out and you'll see that cord right there. And so sometimes you can see that cord and, and you can just push it, kind of hold it up and it'll, that shoulder will come right out under it. And you can just do what's called delivering through and just you know keep that cord kind of up there and deliver the shoulder through it. Now, if, if that doesn't work or if you have enough slack, you can also kind of pull it around and go over the head that way. And then it's totally out of your way. Um, but coming over the shoulder works just as well. So we've guided that baby right underneath the pubic bone. So it's kind of that curve. And then baby will rotate, let it rotate on its own. And then guide that, that anterior shoulder and the head, just guide it up a little bit, controlling the perineum so you don't blow a big laceration here. And then bring that, that posterior shoulder right on. And then from this point, it is slippery and it will come naturally come right on out, really slippery. So if you're on a bed, just lay the baby just like this onto the bed, dry it off quick. Cord is still attached. Lay the baby up here on the uh, maternal abdomen and then we've got things all parallel so we're not draining the blood out. When we spoke about lifting, when we lift by nature, all the infant's blood will come down gravity. this way with mm -hmm. gravity and we cause anemia. So maintaining like this, wait about a minute. Wharton's jelly will either cause this to clamp off itself or you can clamp and cut it if you feel comfortable with that. And then just continue to watch the perineum. The cord will elongate and then you'll be able to deliver the placenta. And so, you know, as you, as that neonate delivers and if there's issues with that shoulder not coming, right, that's when you're gonna wanna bring those legs way back. You're gonna want your assistant to push right above that symphysis pubis with a big fist. And the goal with your fist is to always push towards the nose. So if the baby's pushing this way, you want that fist pushing on that shoulder girdle so that you concave the shoulders. You don't wanna do anything that's gonna broaden the shoulders. So if you think about when you're pushing back here towards the baby's nose, you're gonna cave that shoulder in versus if you're pushing on this part, you're gonna broaden the shoulder. So if you think about that with the fist or whoever's assisting you, tell them push towards the baby's nose or if they're on this side, push towards the baby's nose. Are there any questions on this delivery? Uh, there's a question there, maybe some of you can comment about sending a delivery mom out via HEMS until the baby is delivered, correct? I don't know the answer to that question. Well, so it's 6.48. So if we take a, a five minute break, that'll get us back here at 53. Does that sound reasonable? So, so there's a question here, how close do you cut the cord? So I'm gonna be the clamps. Michelle will be the scissors. So all the baby needs is this much, but really clamp it like this. Mm -hmm. so you don't, you don't have right to get really close to the baby if you don't want, if you wanna cut here and here, but be careful where you cut the cord. Don't cut between the baby and my first clamp. That's a no-no. So there. cut between the clamps, yeah, between but them. the length of that is okay. At the hospital, if you've left an umbilical cord this long on the baby, They'll put a clamp closer to the baby and shorten that up. But if it's a newborn and you um, leave that baby length, sometimes they'll put umbilical catheters through there and start an IV through the through the umbilical cord right there. So that length is pretty important. So I'd say if you can, always leave a couple inches. They'll appreciate it and we will too. 
Dwight, thank you for helicopter EMS. I wasn't familiar with that acronym either, so that's great. Um, so uh, there's a question: If you decide, if you decide to then transport in that reverse position, mom's head is now five inches from the back door. So consider the event of a rear collision. Yeah, that's a lot for you to think of there. Yeah. You would be the experts in the back of a rig. I've not worked in the back of a rig. There's another question about if the woman has had two previous cesareans and the third birth is imminent, you know, what do you do? You deliver. I've definitely had that happen. But you just yeah. be very, very uh, mindful that she has uterine scar there twice. So you're going to be looking for signs of a uterine rupture. And those signs could be, you know, severe hemorrhaging, severe abdominal pain. Her, um, her belly becomes all uh, a different position instead of that nice natural round uterus with the baby. Now the baby's out into the um, whole abdomen, so it's going to all become distorted. And that, that's another reason somebody asked, you know, do we stay at the home and deliver? Or do we move, you know, the, ba the mom to the rig? And I would say if she has had a cesarean delivery in the past, that would be another reason. Let's, let's not stay in the home. Let's get her out and get her moving into the ambulance. Let's take five minutes now to get something to drink, a snack, or use the restroom. And we will be back at 5.56 or 6.56. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Guys, we're, we're going to go ahead and launch okay. the poll. So guys, if you could take a second on break to answer the poll questions, that would be great. If you're Facebook Live, um, unfortunately, you won't be able to answer them, but you'll be able to see the responses. And as I said, we'll be back in five minutes. Um, so when you get a chance, answer these poll questions, and we're going to see, uh, see what the trends are. Here we go.
Okay, shall we get started again? One second, just give me one second. I'll okay. keep wrapping this chat box up and then I will uh, I'll end the poll here. Wonderful, thank you. Are you, are you seeing our shoulder dystocia screen? Yes, I okay. see it. All right, everybody has their answers to the polls in. If you haven't yet, really quickly answer those questions for us and I can end the poll and you guys will be able to see the results. All right, a couple more seconds and I'm gonna end the polling. Three, two, one. All right, so these are always interesting to look at. Can everybody, oh, here, I'm gonna share the results really quickly. Um, can you guys see the results? Yes. Okay. I can't so, see them, sorry. And is anybody else having trouble seeing those polling results? No, yes. Okay. Um, have you ever delivered a baby in the field? We've got a majority of providers that are saying no. 78% said no. Um, when does APCAR scoring begin when delivering a baby? Most people did great on that question immediately. Um, do, uh, do you feel the simulation has prepared you for the field for a field delivery? Somewhat and yes for the majority of the answers. Great. We're going to have some more training here in just a few minutes. Have you ever received education about shoulder dystocia? Some people actually said yes. Um, I had never prior to this webinar. Um, so that's pretty cool that some people have come across shoulder yeah. dystocia, but the majority said no, 75%. Um, do you find simulating learning platforms valuable? Most people are saying yes. Have you recently in the last six months participated in simulating training? We have 30% yes, 69% uh, no. And this one's a lot of place. Like I said, I didn't realize they all, they all presented at once. So I'm not gonna read the last one because um, really we're not done with the webinar yet. But these are great. Okay, so um, you guys, uh, I'm turning the floor over to you. Thank you. Great, so now we're going to do the segment on shoulder dystocia, then we'll go through the simulation on that as well. And we define shoulder dystocia as implementing additional obstetric maneuvers beyond the mild traction to deliver the fetal shoulders and achieve a vaginal birth, preventing fetal asphyxia or permanent herbs palsy, bone fracture, maternal trauma, and death is the goal of this management. The fetal shoulders do not deliver spontaneously. As we went through the simulation and we said that anterior shoulder came right down and then we guided that posterior shoulder out. Shoulder dystocia is caused by the impaction of the anterior shoulder behind the maternal uh, pubic symphysis. It can also occur from an impaction of the posterior shoulder on the sacral promontory. This is unpredicted and unpreventable obstetric emergency. So we know there's risk factors that occur before a woman conceives. We know that their pelvic uh, diameter is an issue and how her pelvic shape and size are. If she was born weighing more than 4,000 grams as a risk factor, her delivering another child that had a shoulder dystocia. So again, that could be something in that primary or secondary assessment that you ask her if she'd had a prior baby where the shoulder got caught. If she's diabetic prior to becoming pregnant, the history of a prior macrosomic infant. So baby weighing over 4,000 grams is macrosomic. Um, and then if she's had a history of gestational diabetic, diabetes in a prior pregnancy, if she's short in stature, if she's obese, if she's multiparous, so having more than one delivery increases her risk for shoulder dystocia. An advanced maternal age or first child at an older age also increases that risk. And we're seeing that more and more women are waiting until they're older to have babies. This is a typical platypoid pelvis. And this shows kind of all of them. We want women delivering with the gynecoid pelvis if you can order that up. 
Shoulder dystocia is an emergency. It occurs in 0.2 to 3% of all births. And in 1992 population study, the rate of shoulder dystocia increased by 35% in a non-diabetic population in the presence of an assisted vaginal birth. So that would occur more in the hospital mm -hmm. facility. And an assisted vaginal birth means forceps or a vacuum delivery. But those are some statistics that we wanted you to know about it can even be high in a controlled environment. Nearly 50% of all shoulder dystocias occur in women that have absolutely none of those characteristics Michelle just mentioned. The common factors associated are a large baby, macrosomia, maternal obesity, post-term pregnancy, that baby's gained more weight, or she's diabetic. A moderate number of brachial plexus injuries are not related to a shoulder dystocia. Nearly 4% of brachial plexus injuries occur following a cesarean delivery. So brachial plexus is pulling on that. So that's why when we do delivery, we're not gonna pull on that fetal head to elongate that, uh, that neck. And we know there's anapartum risk factors as well. So when a woman's pregnant, if she's diabetic, if she's had excessive maternal weight gain, if she's obese, if her birth weight increases to over 4,000 grams, so does that risk of shoulder dystocia. If there's significant risk associated with birth weight or if it's equal to 4,500 grams, so an even bigger baby. If there's suspected macrosomia, it's not an indicator for it to induce the baby though. Um, so that's why some of those women will still go post-term. That's another kind of assessment question to be asking. A male fetus, there's 75 or 70% 70 of those born that are over 4,500 grams were male fetuses. And 51% of all males, well, all births are male. So a male fetus does uh, have a Increase. risk there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Being post date, advanced maternal age, and then children's dyscocia reoccurs in about 10% of subsequent pregnancies. Intrapartum risk factors while she's in labor dysfunctional labor contraction pattern, insufficient contractions. The uterine muscle, the myometrium, is dysfunctional, not working together. Male presentation, we're not exactly head down. We might be a little kitty wampus, maybe a brow presentation. Um, lopsided, we've seen that a little bit. We've seen some face presentations. Yeah. They will all contribute to having some trouble with that delivery. Um, maternal pelvic structure and soft tissue. Pelvic is the structures we just so showed you. Soft tissue is those morbidly obese women, all that tissue is folding down onto that birth canal. The fetal um, anterior shoulder fails to rotate. That's what causes that impaction on the pubis or the posterior shoulder by the sacral promontory in those large babies. And so we know there's certain movements that the baby has when it comes down the birth canal. And this, these pictures depict that. If you're interested in learning more, there's a video link there that you can go to. And it's an excellent video. Yes. Most occurrences of shoulder dystocia, again, are not predicted. There's no method to identify which fetuses will experience shoulder dystocia. Ultrasound measurements for macrosomia are just estimates. They can be off by about two pounds. Um, those there at delivery should anticipate and recognize the shoulder dystocia and go through a step-by-step -step algorithm. Delivery must occur with an effective time frame to prevent injury to the mother, the fetus, or to both of them. One person should be assigned to the mother, and if you've got someone else who can be looking for those symptoms, and we'll talk about those of a dystocia, those characteristics, then they can pay attention to, to those as well. We know the healthcare team may observe those recognizable, what's called the turtle sign, and that's when the baby head comes out and then it goes back in. And it's quite distinct. There's another uh, YouTube video that you can go to to actually watch that occur during a delivery. It's pretty scary in real life when that happens because everything should just come out, right? So when it goes back in, you know there's something going on there. And that is certainly when you don't want to be pulling on that baby's head. And you don't want her pushing either to help facilitate that process because if she continues to push, she's just impacting it more and more. She's just not going to go past that sacrum or that pubic bone. So we're going to walk you through some of the steps that you go through instead. Um, we talked about the uh, it cannot be predicted based on risk factors because it can happen to anyone. We should always be alert to that. We always um, need to be alert to the time of delivery.
from the time the baby's head is delivered to the time that the rest of the baby is born should be about four minutes. Otherwise, we're gonna cause asphyxia in that deoxygenated baby. So we're gonna walk you through these steps that you'll be able to go through and be able to get the baby out within that time frame. Because that goal of management in regards to fetal outcome is to prevent that asphyxia and that umbilical cord from being compressed, avoid physical injury, and including but not limited to bone fractures or herbs palsy and to prevent death. We don't want fetal death, not on our watch. Um, the goal management for the mother includes prevention of injury, including bone fracture for her or extensive tissue damage. Maternal trauma, however, may need to occur to prevent permanent injury to her child. As with any delivery, be prepared. Have the equipment set up available in your rig that you need. Um, warm blankets, warm linen, um, resuscitation supplies and equipment, medications if you need those, supplies to get some cord blood. Then Michelle mentioned the red top uh, tube would be very helpful. And then they can determine that acid base uh, levels on that infant once you get to the uh, hospital. And we know the pushing efforts by the mom should be stopped immediately when you recognize that that shoulder is impacted. You should provide, you can't do excessive rotation to the neck either because some people, they just kind of freak out and they'll start rotating that fetal head. And the same thing, there's a ton of nerves that come down through this neck. So if you're rotating that head, you're going to be damaging those nerves. So it's a hands-off approach, moving on to these different maneuvers that we're going to go through. Again, fundal pressure is not an obstetric maneuver. There's not any place that that should be done. If you push on the maternal fundus and you push down, you're further impacting that shoulder that is, is lodged. The maternal bladder should be emptied if distended because it, in a sense, acts like a water balloon and, and also doesn't allow the fetus to come down through. So you may have to put a straight catheter in, empty her bladder, and then remove that straight catheter to allow for more room. No one single maneuver is more effective than another, but we suggest doing the least invasive ones first and going through that algorithm. And so here's Frida with these shoulder dystocia maneuvers. The first is to call for help and make sure you have a, you know, as much help as you can there. Um, so F in Frida stands to flex her hips. And then the R is to rotate that fetal shoulder towards the fetal nose. So remember me talking about always, you know, towards the nose, you wanna be bringing that shoulder, whether it's the front one or the back one or however that baby's position, shoulders always towards the nose. Because again, you're breaking that shoulder girdle versus making your shoulders broad. We don't want broad shoulders in this situation. The E in Frida is for episiotomy. And sometimes you just have to cut that tissue between the vagina and the anus. Delivering that posterior arm of what we call swimmer's move. So if this is the shoulder that's caught behind the symphysis pubis, bringing that arm out and up, why we call the swimmer's move. And then uh, moving her to all fours can also be a maneuver. And that's a simple enough thing to do. You know, roll her over and have her get on her hands and knees. Uh, so that's the A in Frida. And the S is the suprapubic pressure. And uh, you kind of see that in both places on this slide because you typically do that when you flex her hips, you just push down in that same area. But you can go back to that maneuver, right? You can go back to any of these. You may need to go through them each five times before you get the baby to deliver. And that's okay. Just keep going and keep trying different things. And when, and when that anterior shoulder is, is caught behind the mother's pubic bone, when you put her on her hands and knees, by nature and gravity, the baby drops down a little bit and may dislodge that all on its own. And then you have to kind of think backwards. It's a little different to deliver a baby when she's on her hands and knees, but um, it could be very successful and prevent injury to both. So now we're going to go through the stim simulation. Mm -hmm. So let's get that rolling. You guys had a bunch of questions in the chat box, by the way. So. Okay. Yeah, because we can't see that when we have our presentation up. So it's probably better too, because it can be distracting. Yeah. But yeah, there's a bunch in here. So advanced maternal age is when you're 35 years of age and greater. So you may hear geriatrics in pregnancy as well, but 35 and older is advanced maternal age. When you qualify for a discount, dystocia is an epidemic in Chicago. I am so sorry to hear that because it's probably one of the scariest deliveries I've been in. Um, 
And the, the link to the videos are right on the PowerPoint slides. So if you copy and paste those into your browser, you'll be able to find all of those um, videos. And somebody asked if an herbs palsy subsides. Many of them do. So they can come out injured and they'll have just one floppy arm or one arm will be up and be normal and the other will be floppy. And then we sling them, we put them in a sling. And a lot of times it'll, it'll, the herbs palsy will be resolved by the time the mom goes home. Sometimes it's six weeks, sometimes it's 12 weeks. And you know, rarely it doesn't resolve. No. And that can happen too. I really like the comment here about keeping the baby warm and in capital letters, do not ever use a heating pad. No, no, no. True. You would, you would, you could burn the baby heat them way too high. Mom's body temperature will be just perfect and a, a dry blanket will maintain the baby's body heat in that blanket. So very good, very good. Um, Yes, Dwight. Yes, yeah, good. Okay, so we, we, in the last presentation, talked about that imminent birth. So we have an imminent birth there. The baby has come down. We see, the, we see the fetal head, and I can see the forehead here. So the forehead is on maternal um, left. So I know that I need to do suprapubic from this way. So if I'm assisting Michelle, I'm going to go to the other side of the bed so that I can push this way. I do not want to go that way. So push the shoulders through. Many, many times, just have her bend at the hips and the knees and flex them back, hold her knees, and put super pubic pressure will help dislodge that, um, that shoulder. And I've seen that time and time again. So I would say while you're doing those kind of things, you can ask her to push through that. But if you have her legs flexed and you push there and that shoulder still doesn't deliver, you need to ask her to stop at that point. You don't want her pushing anymore. The next step, and it doesn't matter the order, it's just whatever it comes to your mind. But I would say probably the next step would be is to get your fingers back here and see what you can feel. Because if you can feel the baby's fingers back there, because sometimes they have their hand up there like that, you can just grab those fingers and pull that shoulder up so you get that swimmer's new maneuver. And it doesn't matter which which shoulder you do that on. And so, um, and if you could put your fingers on the posterior part of the baby's head like Michelle is, and you feel that shoulder, it's not likely the one causing you problems. It's probably the anterior shoulder. But you'll have room back there so you can, and it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't take this much trauma in a real birth to get that posterior arm out. They're usually pretty slippery and come pretty easily. And so that would be your swimmer's move, right? You have that posterior arm delivered. Um, and so then typically once you have that, it relieves, it gives it more room for that sacral promontory space. And then this anterior shoulder then will come and that baby will deliver. Um, so that makes it nice. So let's say though you don't have that and you want to try a different maneuver. So uh, we talked about those shoulders and pushing forward on either shoulder. So sometimes you can have room up here and at least get one finger in and push the shoulder again towards the nose. And if that doesn't work and give you any relief, then you come back here. And again, you get your fingers back basically on the scapula. Is where and you want pull to it be. this way. Yep, and be pushing it. So I'm pushing that in pretty hard and, and kind while, of bringing it down. And while you're doing this, you're the secondary person can be doing super pubic as well. So we're getting the posterior and the anterior shoulder and folding them both in. And so I did all that with just my finger. And, and trust me, it is much easier when it's not plastic on plastic. Um, it does work a little better. So either one of those shoulders, I think, is a huge um, you know, benefit to you. And, and so then, let's say those don't work, and you really feel like this is super tight, and you need to cut right there. So you just put your fingers in so that you don't cut the baby's ear. Put the fingers in to protect that, and then just cut that tissue right there. And you cut you know, a fairly good amount of it. That's not going to relieve your shoulder dystocia. That's going to allow you to get a hand in there and then get to the shoulder so that you can relieve the shoulder dystocia. The episiotomy is just purely for you to access. Just not getting that tissue it. out of the way. Yes, getting that tissue out of the way. So, and, 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 and yes. just to clarify, the episiotomy for us, we're not allowed to do that. Um, okay. In the field. So, um, so that's great to have it as something in the, in the back of their minds, but it's not supported in the field. And then the other thing is you have a question, um, uh, one of our viewers, Christina, what would you do if a baby is being born face up so the shoulders are actually in a different position? How do you address that? 
she's talking about, I think. Also, if the baby is born face up, when it's what they call restitute, and as a baby is being birthed, it will restitute one way or the other. So the shoulders will always, they won't necessarily follow the face. The shoulders will always be vertical in the birth canal. So the shoulders will always be like this. They'll never, the shoulders won't ever be like that or like this in the birth canal. It just doesn't ever go that way. They're always um, parallel in the birth canal, no matter how the face or the head is. So you would have that, you might have the head out, it's looking up, but you wanna feel inside and you'll feel the shoulders up and down. Mm -hmm. Anterior, posterior. Yeah. Okay, I was just asking because they had to physically rotate me when I was born because I was born uh -huh. face up. Yeah, that's yeah. why I was yeah, asking. So we do that. We do that if <laughs> yeah, mom, that's if really... that was in the hospital, but that's why yeah. I was asking because yeah. yeah, it's a good I was question. told it was a great labor until they rotated me and then all yeah. the pain showed up. <laughs> yeah, so true. Yes. So yes. we do that as the baby's coming down the birth canal. So if you think about, like we mentioned earlier, like a first time baby is like 0.6 hours from the time they're complete till they actually deliver. So it'd be during that process of the baby coming down the birth canal that we rotate those babies. Because a, a what we call a face up baby or sunny side up is much more difficult to deliver than a baby that's facing her backside. They don't make that curve underneath the pubic bone as well when they're looking up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, really good question there we welcome questions oh okay good it is um and so there's another mnemonic type of thing or maybe more of a flyer that is at the end of the shoulder dystocia presentation that goes through all of those uh, maneuvers so then the one that we didn't talk about um, you know, during this part of it is moving her to all fours. Shelly talked about it before. And so sometimes they need help, you know, getting to all fours, but that can make a big difference. So now here in this position, of course, you can't do um, super pubic or McRoberts, but you can still get in there and rotate those shoulders if you need to. Because it right? drops that baby right down into her abdomen. Yeah. So it, it just changes the dynamics there. And so a lot of times you can get, you know, a finger maybe where you couldn't get it before, and then you can assist with that delivery. If that doesn't work, and I've seen it not work before, yeah. take her from her hands and knees presentation and turn her back over again. And then try those maneuvers again. Remember, least invasive first. So draw her legs back, flex super pubic, feel the anterior shoulder, feel for the posterior shoulder, try to rotate, see if you can feel an arm coming up there, do the swimmers maneuver. You may have to move her back onto her hands and knees again and remember during all of this it is most important for you to know you know what to do go through one step at a time give the mother reassurance you're doing good you're doing good we're trying to get baby to move and keep talking to her because her anxiety is escalating and so is all of the family but if you can maintain that calm and controlled environment then they kind of follow suit with you as well and realize these maneuvers resolve shoulder dystocias, right? I, I think about my career, I've been in medicine since the mid nineties, and I've heard of one case of all the doctors that I know and all the hospitals that we know where it didn't dissolve it and that patient had to be taken back for a C-section. These maneuvers work, right? They do. And so just staying calm, like Shelly said, and, and working your way through them, I think is really important because, um, and then going back and revisiting them. So um, if Frida is the mnemonic that helps you or the other one that walks through all those and you can laminate those, print those off, put those wherever you need them, you know, so that you're aware of those maneuvers. Cause sometimes when you're in the heat of the moment, you may not remember them. I think the swimmers move is like one of the coolest things to do. And that's resolved every dystocia that I've been in, you know, if the other things haven't helped. So that's a fairly straightforward one. So I would consider laminating these or other mnemonics that help you have them in your work environment. Um, you're going for a imminent delivery, pull those mnemonics out, quick read for, through them in route and be well prepared. I'm just reading some of the comments again about the episiotomy being out of the scope. So understand that. Um, so then we do not want you to do that <laughs> at all. Right. Practice within your scope. Yep. 
provide the safest and quality care you can. And the goal of maternal 911 is to decrease maternal and infant mortality across our state and across the uh, entire nation. Um, women, women and babies shouldn't be dying. Great, you guys are amazing. Um, this was just an incredible presentation. Um, so I'm gonna just give these guys some time to ask some more questions. Um, we can open up the floor here in a second too if someone wants to unmute themselves. Um, a couple of really quick just bookkeeping, housekeeping things. Um, the quiz link, I just posted it in the chat box. A lot of folks like that convenience. So if you wanna click on that link, it should take you directly to the evaluation and quiz. You have to complete this within two weeks to get your CE. If you do not, you do not qualify for continuing ed. So be sure you complete that. Um, and be sure you write some great comments in for Shelly and Michelle, because you will be evaluating them as well. Um, and we, oh, go ahead. Andrea, and, and we do welcome questions. Um, mm -hmm. You can go to our website. There's a link to, to our email. Uh, we welcome questions, comments. Um, we have taken from our 18 modules, created an, an emergency uh, personnel's, um, uh, well, what do I want to call that? Uh, program, a yeah. program for emergency people. Because some of our topics probably wouldn't be applicable to the work environment that you're in. So we created a set of modules that would be. And those are yeah. accessible yeah. providers, right? They are. Yep, if you go so the, to our maternal911.com website, you'll yeah, see those. So, so it's, a, it's essentially a free resource. So if they visit your website, they can click on the links and they can view them, right? Oh, no, they won't be able to view them. No, no. yeah, you would Is not it just be able a to preview? view them. I, I've never tried actually opening um, any of the links. I've just seen yeah. all of the material. Mm -hmm. Yep, it, it just uh, takes you to that. And then if you contacted us, we could work with you to get you set up in the program. Cool. Okay. Great. Like yeah. So check out their. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Check out their their website and and keep in mind, guys. Um, they're going to be back with us for part two, December 9th. Um, so if you really enjoyed this presentation, we're going to delve into some more OB emergencies December 9th. So um, I'm going to open up registration here shortly. I'm almost done with the links. Look for those and register for that uh, that webinar as well. Uh, the Facebook recording is actually going to be up on our Facebook page um, and be patient with us, Ken. We are doing this for the first time, um, so we're probably just going to figure out where to file it. It should be under our videos, though, would be my, my guess. But yeah, we're going to leave this recording up. You can access it and share it with whoever you like. And please do. You know, Shelly and I are very passionate about maternal health, and we want this shared with as many that can... That, you, that can be out there and benefit from it and help both those mothers and those babies have a healthy delivery. So feel free, um, the floor is open. We do have, what time is it? We've got a few minutes. So if you guys have any questions, you can type it into the chat box. You can um, unmic yourself and ask questions. If there's something in the field that was unusual that happened to you and you're just curious about it or something that you, you know, just wanna ask about, now would be a great time to ask. So I'm gonna open up the floor to you guys. Feel free to unmute or type your, your question in the chat box. I have a quick question. Can you guys hear me okay? I yeah. sure, we sure can. Okay, so my question is, is you talked about um, how the cord could be around the neck and be too taut to either slide over or the head over or the shoulder. So you said we could clamp. Now, do we cut in that instance? Cut the yes. cord? Or sure do. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll okay. show you that. Can Can you see our mannequin? Okay. Yep. Okay. So, so you've tried, I'm your clamp. You try to push it back. You have no room. You try to pull it over. It's not budgy, right? So get it two clamps, and then Just like that. And then I'm going to take scissors and I'm going to cut across that. So that's going to okay. give you that bridge to, to open that up. And then it just falls open and then literally the baby, and then it can really hold them up. And in fact, it can even be around there. I've delivered babies where it's around there two and three times, right? Even, but so the first thing, don't freak out if you see it around there three times, because you can, a lot of times, let's, let's kind of do that. A lot of times there's enough slack and you can start to kind of work with it and work with it, pull one over the head 
and work with it, work with it, and pull the other one over the head. So a lot of times you can even reduce two or three wraps around the head. So if, if work you, with it. And if you can't reduce it, pick one part of the loop. Don't, don't clamp and cut both of those loops. Try to get under one loop. And then when you cut, then you can unroll it that yeah. way. Yeah. Do you understand that? Yep, thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome, our You're pleasure. Welcome. Great question. Anybody else have any questions? Sandra, we have Blaine on the line that has his hand up. We welcome your question. Go ahead, Blaine. Uh, yes, uh, what is herbs palsy? So what herbs palsy is, is when the, the shoulder has been lodged underneath that pubic symphysis and usually there's some sort of stretch that occurs between the ear and the shoulder and if you look at this anatomy there's amazing nerve complex that comes out that allows you to do all these cool things with your hand and you think about all that you know from touching and all of that that takes a special nerve for each one of those to do those things so an herbs palsy can damage that and what it does then it doesn't allow some of those nerves to work and they lose function and, and they call it a nervous palsy, they end up like they are in this posture quite a bit because of the nerves that occur, um, the nerve damage that occurs in the neck. Now that can occur just with a pregnancy. Like I've, I've C-sectioned a baby before that came out with an herbs palsy. So it can also be how the fetus is laying in the abdomen and not related to delivery. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. welcome. More questions, we like them. I have another question. Sure. Yeah. So I had a friend that recently had a baby that had face presentation yeah. and they were considered about paralysis um when the baby was being born so like when we do have that face presentation baby how are we supposed to handle that in the field knowing that we could they could be possibly paralyzed it'd be very unusual you know to to, to paralyze that baby you think about trying to get this baby in a face presentation um but they they just come out where um, you don't see this part of the head all you see and it's really quite disturbing to deliver a face presentation because you think about all this area and all the pressure that's on it, their lips get huge, their eyes get huge and they get all like this, but they're all swollen. So they look just terrible coming out in the delivery. And so you see this uh, face and that's basically all you see is this face coming out at you and you oh, just oh. deliver through that, you know, and it, it, it takes a bit longer. Like you'll definitely have more time just looking at this face as it comes out because it doesn't have that, those typical, um, what they call restitution of the baby coming down because of the way the face is, you know, right there. Um, but paralysis wise, there's not really a great concern about that. Um, I've delivered a fair amount of face presentations. And so again, once the baby is off the perineum and it comes out, it will then restitute and it'll go one way or it'll go the other. But um, realize once the baby does deliver, it's still gonna have all those swollen features for a day or so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Can you show how you would apply pressure if mom is hemorrhaging with the fist? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So let's say that you, because you don't do episiotomy, she has a big laceration here in her perineum. You're gonna take a towel, a washcloth, the gauze, whatever you have, and with your fist, hold that pressure right there. And that should, just like any wound, you think of a wound on, on an arm or on a leg, how you apply pressure in the field, you're going to apply a pressure to the perineum as well. But now I also think about like if you're having a postpartum hemorrhage and you um, are concerned about the fundus, so you'll want to take one hand like this fist up here and kind of hold there, rub that fundus and rub that fundus like as hard as you can. And you can take this hand and put it in the vagina. And again, you're creating a um, pressure point of the uterus, essentially. And I know it seems crazy to put your fist in the vagina, but that head just came out, right? So you think about my head versus the hand, the head of the baby versus my fist. 
So it can really go up in there very easily. So you put your hand in there and then you grab that fundus and you're squishing the two of those. And that just holding right there can save you from that woman hemorrhaging. And so that's something to think about too and just holding that pressure. And then while, while you're doing that, the person helping you is gonna have that baby and be resuscitating, but be mindful if you can give some IV oxytocin or an IM injection of oxytocin, that would be very helpful also. How common is the turtle sign? Um, will it result in shoulder dystocia? More than likely, it's yeah. not very common. I mean, but shoulder dystocia is not very common either, right? Um, but I think that's just something to be looking for, you know, so that baby's head will come down, it'll come down, it'll come down, it'll come down, and then it'll Ooh. go back up. It goes back. And you're like, what it just happened? And then there. it keeps doing that. It goes like that, goes back up. And it realize it'll do that like with contractions to some degree. But I'm talking like a good pushing contraction, baby's coming down, baby's coming down, and then whoop, it goes back a little bit. And that, uh, that link we have to YouTube where it shows the turtle sign, classic. It's yeah. Very, very good. Very yep. good video. Yeah. So take a look at that. Um, but I'd say the bigger thing is, is just, you know, making sure those shoulders come down. And, and if one doesn't, then just be aware. Get those legs back, get that super pubic pressure. Look for that close to your arm. Push those shoulders, you know, front or back, and, and you you can keep rocking, right? You can keep rocking those shoulders by pushing one, pushing the other, pushing one. You can go back and forth pretty easily with your finger in there, um, pushing those shoulders to help. Kind of you know, creating like a screw. Yep, rocking those out. Mm -hmm. And Renee, we welcome you. We love your question. How about yeah. breach and maneuvers? That's like a whole nother topic, but it is. Uh, it yeah. Is. Maybe we could cover a little bit of that in part two. That, yeah, we yeah, sure could. We sure could. We sure yep, could. Not a problem at all. Yep. Is that's even more unusual? You know, I would say um, in my years of experience, I've probably delivered five breech babies. You just it just doesn't happen very often. A lot by cesarean, but not vaginally. And many of the topics in maternal nine one one are those high acuity, low occurring events things we hope we never see, but sometime in our career, we come across some of them. Yes, yes, you're gonna see three more topics when we see you back in December. We'll be covering completely different topics. Yeah. And we, we have 18 topics now. You guys did a great presentation. Thanks for uh, doing this. Appreciate it. Charles, You're thank so you so welcome. much. Thank you. We love doing what we do. Share the knowledge. Empowered professionals are educated professionals. So we, uh, we commend each of you for joining us this evening and thank you for the kind words and feedback that mm -hmm. helps us as well. And for your service, I feel like you all are kind of being hit pretty hard right now with some of the movements going on and we we thank you for being out there and uh, being available for our friends and family when they need us <laughs> all right well i can't thank you guys enough um this is was an incredible presentation so we will be leaving that facebook live video up on facebook if you want to okay. check it out yeah, um, thank you we love to under videos um, and we are a little bit over on time, so I don't want to keep you too long, um, but we can slowly wrap this up and then uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll see a lot of these guys in part two in December. So we'll look forward. yeah, this was excellent though. Thank you so much, um, but feel free to sign off whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Right. We appreciate your time. Keep doing all you're doing. All right. Thank you. And yeah, have a good night. Thank so, you. Well, you also. Bye now.